Good evening. Good evening. 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 Okay, I grew up in a black church. I got to hear somebody say something. So first of all, I want to thank you for the, for the opportunity, and, and, and thank you, Father, for your, for, for your leadership. Um, this, is, this is not an easy time to, to lead any big organization, but certainly uh, as it relates to our institutions of, of higher learning, this is a, a difficult age as we try to traverse a lot of different challenges, and so thank you so much. You know, as I think this morning and thought about what we were going to address and engage with together... As a person of deep faith, what I thought about was the scripture that has sort of driven my life and that I think should drive what we do in public service. Do mercy, love justice, and walk humbly with our God. And too often, where I work, we're not doing a lot of those things. We're doing the exact opposite of those things. Too often, I think, we find ourselves in a position where we have to choose the least worse option instead of help and center the folks that should be at the center of everything, the least, the last, and the lost. I think that's the work of our time. And for me, probably like many of you, I don't get to this conversation with you tonight without some really good parents. Now, I grew up in North Philadelphia, right by Temple University. We're at Villanova, but I still have to say, go out. I don't know wherever I am. (laughs) And I was really lucky because I did, second only to your parents. I had the best parents in the world. I really did. They just didn't like each other. (laughs) And so what that meant for me is that my parents separated when they were pretty young. I lived six different places by the time I graduated high school. My dad served his life, worked his life as a social worker. My mom was trained as a CNA at Jefferson Hospital and spent most of her life working as a home health aide. And there was a moment that I often return to when I think about anything that I've done in public service. It can go back to a simple moment. So mention parents' divorce. We're moving all around. I'm living on this new block, which used to be in my legislative district. And I come home one day, and I am 12, and I am full of every preteen hormone that you can have. I'm living on a new block that I do not want to live on. And I am frustrated by the tenuousness of life for a lot of working poor families, where everything feels so shaky all the time. And so I came home, and I come to my mom, and I am going off about all the different things on this new block, and this new house, with these new people that I hate. And my mom is just smoking a cigarette that she just lit on the stove. Don't smoke. Well, that's what she was doing, okay? And she looked at me, and I will exclude some of the actual words that she used, but you use your imagination. And she said, if you care so much, and certain, certain, sir, then why don't you go do something about it? And so I thought I was gonna get a hug, but instead I got some tough love. And I will tell you that has served me really well because in that moment I decided to run for junior black captain. It was the first thing I ever did civically. And it was this great opportunity to get engaged for the first time in my neighborhood in a small way that I could see, touch, feel, engage with, understand. And I will tell you, that conversation has literally shaped every political decision that I've made. If you care so much, go do something about it. And so when I think about what happens in the legislature that I just came here and started complaining about, I spent a lot of time on the outside of the legislature, running people's campaigns, being involved in community activities, showing up to meetings, hosting my own meetings, demanding that elected officials do the things that I wanted them to do. And sooner or later, my mom had passed, but I could kind of hear that wisdom in my ear. If you care so much, this is your opportunity to do something 
about it. And I would say that in this moment, we find ourselves, we are certainly all called, in different ways, certainly, but I think all called to do something about it, to do something about chronic poverty that has made it so difficult for so many families in a country that has so much, so many families like mine are still just figuring it out. I think about the fact that in the wealthiest nation in the history of humankind, my mom had to ration her insulin. And I buried both of my parents. I alluded to my father's passing by the time I was 27 because they didn't have access to the type of health care that everybody deserves. I think about the fact that in neighborhoods all across our country, because we should not fall into the trap or believe the lie that gun violence only happens in poor communities, only happens in black communities. It is a crisis across our commonwealth. And statistically, if you want to look at the FBI data on this point, we are seeing the highest increase in crime actually in our rural communities. So much of it driven by folks who have died by suicide. So when I think about this moment, we have to address and maybe somebody in this room is called to do something about the fact that many of you spent time in school learning what it meant to run, fight, or barricade yourself in your classroom in case there was an active shooter. And so many parents wake up every day terrified when their kid gets on the bus or goes to the store because they're not sure if they're coming back. And so I would suggest that this is a moment, maybe, where each of us are called to do something about it. I think about this moment where so many people feel no connection to our government system at all. Some are so despondent, so frustrated that the siren song of somebody saying, I alone can fix it, and if it didn't turn out the way you want it, it's rigged, that sounds pretty good. It sounds pretty good when one person says, I'm going to come in and I'm going to fix it. I, I'm, I promise you, if you are frustrated, that sounds really nice. And when I come to my constituents and have to explain, or have to explain to you tonight, that when we talk about doing something about the challenges that we face, when we talk about that moral arc of justice that Dr. King talked about, I would like to remind you that the arc doesn't bend just because it bends every couple of years. It bends because people care enough to go do something about it. And so I work in a building and I work in a place where if I have a good idea, go with me on this process. If I have a good idea, great idea, and I happen to think I have a lot of good ideas. Sometimes my chief of staff says it's not, it's not as good as you think, Rep. But sometimes I think they're pretty good. For me to get a bill passed in the House of Representatives in the state of Pennsylvania, First thing I have to do is to have a good idea. Check, we're doing that all the time. Second thing is I have to do is I have to get some people who are smarter than me, some great attorneys, to draft up that great idea into legislative language. And it has to hopefully be written in a way that it can withstand public hearings, public testimony, and a robust amendment process that will happen in the committee to which the speaker assigns it. Now, within that committee, I'd then need to get 14 votes on my good idea after it withstands public testimony. After it gets 14 votes, I have to then wait for that bill to go to the floor of the House of Representatives, where all 203 of my colleagues, even those who are not on the committee, now they get to put amendments on my piece of legislation. And then after we go through that process, what we call second consideration, then that bill comes up for final passage, for final vote, where then everybody gets to speak about the final product and whether or not they like that. After those speeches are done, and you would be shocked, and I'm happy most of you are sitting down, you'd be shocked to believe that politicians like to talk. And so sometimes that could take <laughs> some time on third consideration. And after that is done and we have the up or down votes, I need to get in the House of Representatives 102 people, including myself, to agree with me that my great idea that has gone through two rounds of amendments, that it's still a great idea. After that happens, that bill has to now go to the Senate. And then that bill goes to the Senate and it goes to another committee 
where senators get to decide if they want to also amend the great idea that the House thought was so good and so good that we gave it 102 votes. And then after it leaves the Senate, it has to go to the Senate floor, where it will go through the process of being amended again and then voted on final passage. Now, if that bill is not exactly the same as the bill that I sent from the House over to the Senate, then the House has to vote on that bill again, on a, on a concurrence vote, to say whether or not we agree with the changes of the Senate. And then if that is to happen, then we have to have a governor who's willing to sign the legislation. Then after the governor signs the legislation, I have to go back and hope that that legislation was written in such a way by these incredibly smart attorneys and not amended in a way that is illegal, that if somebody sends it to the courts, that it will withstand judicial review. Now, if you are living in a neighborhood where you are concerned about your next meal, that sounds like too long of a process. And so it sounds very good when somebody says, well, I'm just going to fix it. I'm big enough. I'm bad enough. I don't care about your complicated process of 102 votes and 26 votes in the Senate and a, govern and a governor who has to sign it and judicial review. I alone am going to fix it. That sounds really good. But when we think about what it takes to bend the moral arc, it never happens because one person is big enough and bad enough. It never happens because somebody by fiat says we are going to go through and brush past all of our complex systems that preserve so many of the rights and protections that I think folks in this room probably enjoy. And so when you think about what this moment calls for, I am urging you to not give away your power to one great leader who you love. And that happens. And I'm not just talking about one president or one politician. That happens all the time. People say, well, you know, there's a politician I heard and they sound really good. They were speaking about the things that I care about. I mean, I was shaking my head so much, I could have could just fallen off. They were like, it was great. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to vote for that person and now, you know, my work is done. And then in two years or four years or six years, depending on the term, that elected official who I gave all my power to, they can come back and tell me what happened with the 102 votes and the 26 votes and the governor's signature and the judicial process, and then I can just be a spectator in what's happening because I chose a champion. When we think about the legacy of Dr. King, a part of the mistake that we make is that we think it was just one man. We remember the civil rights movement as this one guy who gave this great speech one time, and then what happened was everything changed. But instead, what happened was there were so many people who recognized that they themselves were imbued with all the power that it took to change the things that they were frustrated with. That they themselves had it within their power, within their authority, to take the things that they cared so much about and actually go do something. And so for one man, yeah, it was, going, it was about giving not just one nice speech, but about a bunch of nice speeches. It was about organizing people all across this nation and getting people engaged. But for other people, it was getting engaged beyond just the Montgomery bus boycotts. There are so many that we don't even talk about or think about, where folks every single day had to wake up and pack a lunch, had to decide that they were going to carpool to work. And for many of those domestic workers who took the brunt of this in rural Georgia and rural Mississippi, they could not be late to work. They had to be there on time. They had kids to raise. And so they had to figure out how do we create a route where I take care of my kids in the morning, where we're out of the door at such a time where we can get to the place we need to go to, and where whoever's driving the car can drop off people along the route because they were no longer going to ride a segregated bus. Now, it feels good to remember that about one lady named Rosa Parks. It feels good to just think it was one person in one moment. And we can deify that one person and put all the responsibility of bending the arc into the, the champion that we choose. But the truth is, it required something from a lot of people whose names you will never know or never read. And so when we think about the big issues that you care about, the big issues that are shaping our time, whether or not we have a planet to live on, whether or not we treat people with dignity and respect, no matter who they are or where they come from, whether or not everybody 
in Pennsylvania and all across our country actually, actually have access to the American promise. When we think about what it takes to do that in practice, I promise you it's bigger than one person. I promise you it's bigger than one vote. I promise you it's bigger than one tweet. I promise you it's bigger than one letter. It's bigger than one Facebook post. It's bigger than one petition. It's bigger than just the moment when you feel like you have the energy to do it. Because when I think about where I grew up, when I think about what the people deserve, I don't know about you, but I'm willing to do the hard work, to have a good idea, to send it to some smart attorneys, to put it on the floor, to get it 102 votes, to send it to the Senate, to get the governor to sign it, to send it to the courts, make sure it's legally sound, and to do things that change the systems that have made it so difficult for people to live with the dignity that they deserve. I'm willing to do that work. And I happen to have a job where I can file the bill, where I can make that vote. But you all have a job as well. And so I stand here saying something that a lot of politicians never say. I would never ask you, and I would actually urge you, never, to join anybody's cult of personality. I lay next to somebody every night who doesn't want to join my cult, so if they're not in, <laughs> you shouldn't be in. But what I would ask you to do is to believe in the power of small actions from people who are concerted enough, brave enough, committed enough to actually see things change. I'm looking at my phone, something I never do, because I want to get this right. I'm going to read, as I end here, two words from two incredible writers that have shaped my life and I hope shape the way that you think about doing the work that I've just explained at great length that we need you to do. Bell Hooks writes in a book called All About Love, and if you do not own the book All About Love, you go get that book and buy it from a local bookstore if you can. It says, those of us who have already chosen to embrace a love ethic, allowing it to govern and inform how we think and act, know that when we let our light shine, we draw to us and are drawn to other bearers of light. We are not alone. Now I read that quote for two reasons. Because in a moment that can feel so tenuous, in a moment that can feel so angry, to talk about love sounds naive. But love, in fact, is the only thing that bends that moral arc. It is not hate that is going to get you up every day to take a bus route when you want to desegregate Montgomery County or other bus routes. They weren't doing that because they hated everybody. Hate is not a renewable resource. It is a resource. Hey, it can be a fuel. It certainly can. There are some people who you, who you know. I know we're all, now Father, please turn your head because we're all, we're all working on it. But there might be some people in your mind who you do not like too much. You all are so nice, you're a Villanova, of course you're there, you like everybody. <laughs> but there are some people I can think about who I would rather not spend dinner with. Now, trying to get them, that can be a minimally useful fuel source, but it's not the type of fuel that's going to gird you for the long process that it takes to make big things happen. It's not enough. And so what we need to do, actually do is to love the change that we want to see even more than we hate the people who are trying to block the change. The, that's not a nice thing to do. That is a necessity for you to create the world that you want to see. I promise you, I love a good protest. I've been at a lot. But we're not going to protest our way to the change that we want to see. That is a useful tool. But it is not the only tool. At some point, you got to build something. And you can't build anything on an empty stomach. And the fuel that it takes to build something in community, that's driven by love. The idea that the people in my neighborhood, even the people who aren't a part of my family, even the people who I don't know, even the people who I'm fighting for, who I'll never get to meet, that they deserve to live in a world that is as open and warm for them as I deserve. And I care about them enough to do this work even when I'm individually tired. 
I care about them enough to do what's necessary, even when the process of change sounds complicated. So that's the first thing I want to leave you with. The second thing I want to leave you with is a short quote from a letter from Zora Neale Hurston, also a great writer. And she says in this, in this letter, and I'm going to find it here because this is really good. And I'm not going to mess this up. I have never liked stale phrases and bodiless courage. I've never liked stale phrases and bodiless courage. I end there because everything we talked about sounds good. And it sounds good in a couple of minutes. Sounds good in a speech. You might even leave here and something may have moved you in a way that you write it down and you tweet about it. But none of that matters. If these are just stale words that you heard and that did not transform the way that you engage in the world. None of that matters if you lack the type of body full and not body less courage that it takes to do big things. But here is the good news if you're brave enough to tap into your power. The good news is that courage is contagious, just like light that Bell Hooks spoke about. And when you are courageous enough to stand up, what you will find is that there are other people who are waiting to stand. They might just be waiting on you. And so I will end when I began. I ran for junior block captain. I did. And now it is very alluring to say, well, I ran for junior block captain. I changed the block. It was, it was incredible. But what happened was is I had to knock on all the doors on the block. And I talked to them about the block that I wanted to see, where we all came out bi-monthly bi and cleaned the block together. And where we then decided at big holidays, on, the, on those big holidays, we would get a permit and close down the block and have a, have a block party, like North Philly does better than anybody in the world. Don't let West Philly lie to you about the block parties. We do it better. And what ended up happening is there were a lot of people who also agreed with me that they were frustrated too about the trash on the block. And they, too, wanted to engage with their neighbors a little bit more. And here it was, a little 12-year-old kid knocking on their door, asking them to sign my little paper to become junior block captain because I had that vision for our community. And then what happened is a bunch of people came out to start doing the block cleanups, which only started with a few of us. And then a bunch of people came out for the barbecue. More people always come out for the barbecue than the cleanup, I will say that. But what I would suggest to you and end with is that when we get away from the deification, when we stop looking at politics as Voltron, and if you don't know what Voltron is, go look at Voltron. And if I'm too old where people are like, they don't know what Voltron is, then I'm in trouble. Google Voltron, I swear to God. You're like, you have to Google it. It was a thing, and there were like these multiple different things, and then they would come together and form this big robot, and like they would fight people, okay? And so what I, I say this to say, politics and the work that we need to do is not that. It's not you giving away your power every six months when we have an election to some person who can come back and just give you updates on what's happening in your life and in your community and on the big issues that you care about. Politics is actually a bunch of little Voltrons deciding that we have what it takes within ourselves, that we are already full and complete, that we are already imbued with all of the grace, passion, courage, talent that we need to do the necessary work to bend that moral arc. And when we do, when we all commit to that, our world, our community, our neighborhoods will be the place that we love enough to create. So God bless you, and I'll stop there. Thank you. We are grateful for your time with us, and we do have some time for questions. So I'm going to 
Okay, I will. We have a standing mic over there. Something if you want to walk over or uh, you can pull stuff, I'll bring it to you. So, good, raise your hand. We don't have much time with him tonight. He's going to have to leave. So, let's seize the moment. Who's going to start? Representative, first and foremost, thank you for taking the time to speak to our community today. Thank, thank you. Thank you. My name is Dean Millard. I am a junior student studying political science and communications from North South Pennsylvania. Two good majors, man. Thank you. You did it right. Pleasure to meet you before. Um, so I was wondering, you talk about you know the strenuous process of you know citizens and, and constituents seeing change, and that there's a long process and journey to get there. In your position, you know, how do you give them the confidence in you and in other representatives to deliver on those promises despite all the hurdles that you have to jump over? I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, when I ran for, for office, my former, my former chief of staff, who was then my campaign manager, would always say to me, Malcolm, you cannot keep saying this at events, but I would say it all the time. I never believed that when I got elected, the sky was going to open up. Doves were going to come down, and all the folks who disagreed with my ideas were going to suddenly agree with it because I was there. But what I did believe is that when our government reflects the fullness of its people, it's in a better position to realize the fullness of its promise. What do I mean by that? What I mean in less flowery terms is for a lot of my colleagues, when we talk about issues of poverty, when we talk about what we just did, where we increased the child dependent tax credit. And so if you have a kid, and when you file taxes this year, you are gonna get triple the amount of money you got back last year, triple. I mean, it was so good that I thought about having kids right after the vote, like that's how good <laughs> that deal is. Now that's something I've been trying to see done for three terms. And so what my commitment to people has been in my community, my commitment has been, I'm gonna always tell you the truth. I'm gonna always treat you with the intelligence that you can understand this process. When I, my first budget, I came home and I did a budget town hall and I got all these very complex slides about what was in the budget and the process. And for a lot of people, when we talk about the budget, they think we're talking about one thing. The budget is actually like five or six bills that constitute the budget. And I take people in my district through that process of trying to understand each little thing in the budget, each line item. And I had somebody say to me, well, people don't care about that. I said to them, well, People do care about whether or not their kids go to a quality school and how we deliver on that promise is in the budget. And I think even though it's my job to live in the weeds, I also treat people with the respect of celebrating our accomplishments, of laying out the work that we have left to accomplish, of communicating the hurdles, and then allowing voters to make a decision, in my case, every two years, about whether or not I've done my job in such a way that they want to renew my contract to continue to do that. Now, what happens is, because you talk about that lack of faith, that frustration that people get, is that occasionally, because we do live in the best country in the world, people run. And they say, well, Malcolm got in there, the doves ain't come down, and he ain't fixed all the problems yet. And that sounds, as I said, that sounds very good to people who are frustrated. But what I find is that most people are not only ready to hear the truth, but hungry to know how they can engage. And what I try to do is to lay out how people can engage, arm them with the truth, and then let the politics, let that handle itself. We're looking at you this side of the room before I get out of here. Just one of you has to volunteer as tribute for a question. Can't let this side of the room be the only side. Side's coming strong, I'm sorry. There we go. Of course. Yeah, please. 
Thank you so much for yeah. the wonderful keynote speeches. Yeah, please. Uh, at first, um, before coming down to this room, I thought we were going to come with a big arc when I read like Benny the Hark. I was like, okay, let me see the next Noah, which I read in the Bible, you know. Yeah, so my question is uh, how can policy makers be more attentive to marginalized voices in policy debates? You know, that is a question of that's a question of who chooses to run for office. I don't know how you I don't know that you can teach somebody to be authentic or they would not or they would not be authentic. Um, I think people can just be themselves. And what often happens is that, and I describe it this way, if you've ever, everybody's done karaoke, the people who have no business singing are the first folks up to sing. <laughs> They're the first ones up. Like Sweet Caroline, they are ready. They're ready to go. But the folks who can really sing, who have something to say, they're like, oh, well, I haven't steamed, I haven't been on vocal rest, my band isn't here, I can't do it. And I think that's what happens in our politics. People who have no business being in office, they will run every time. They run every time. They don't know anything about the issues. They don't know how many people are in the house. And they're like, but I'm running. And, you know, and nothing against the gentlemen here, but there's great research on this, that this happens more with men than women. Women in particular look at a job description, not the first to say this, and say, well, I haven't done all these different things, and so oh, I can't run, and I, I can't do it. And there will be a man who will be like, I don't know nothing about this, but <laughs> I can figure it out. <laughs> I can figure it out. I was, in the, I was in the latter camp, actually. When I, when I ran for, for office, my, my, my mom had passed. I, was, I had some time off work. My partner at the time lived in L.A., um, and I had all this time off from work with bereavement and sick leave and all that. And I was getting a bunch of calls from people saying, you should run for office. And I remember saying at the time, I don't know anybody who, could, who would give me $500, let alone the $275,000 that it took me to run my first primary campaign at 27. I didn't know anybody could do that. And my partner had not heard the story about my mom and the junior black captain, we had never talked about that. Said something very similar that like brought that back up in my mind and in my life. It was like, well, you're always talking about this stuff. Why don't you just run and see what happens? I remember just believing that all the things that I thought disqualified me from office actually qualified me. And when I find myself in committee rooms, because there are not a lot of people with my distinctions, I try to move away and not engage, A, with this idea of, 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 of diversity, because even in that, the question is diverse from what? What I like to center is the idea that we are all distinct and that those distinctions are not distractions. Those distinctions matter. Those distinctions inform how we walk in the world, how we see the world around us, and inform how we're going to engage on the very real policy questions that we have to engage with. I happen to embody a number of distinctions that have not been present for many legislators. And so when I got to the legislature, there were a lot of people who wanted me to feel embarrassed or wanted me to feel like I wasn't in the right space. I'll never forget one of my colleagues saying to me, this is, we have this little back room called the ante room. It's like coffee and snacks back there. And there's a big thing around seniority in the House and in the Senate who's been there the longest. And so I'm in this coffee line and this older member doesn't know who I am, and effectively, they're looking at me to like get out of the way, right? I'm like, no, me, coffee, I'm gonna get my coffee, right? And so he says something to me along the lines of, you know, how old are you? And you know, and I told him, oh, I'm 28. He says, oh. And I said, yeah, and it took me only half the time to get here that it took you, you have a lot to learn. <laughs> and I tell that story because that is the way that I walk into every room, into every policy debate. People 
who know what it's like to depend on a government service or know what it's like to bury a loved one or know what it's like to have the walls thrown up that if they have a good idea, they can never actually start that business. Or they go to a school where there's lead, asbestos, and mold, even as we speak, in the building. People who know those things actually probably know a lot more about the world than folks who were born on third base, think they hit a home run, and want to tell me about what it takes to run the plates. I know what it takes. And I got to the legislature, even at a young time, with brown knees from sliding to every single base with a lot of people who did not want me to be where I was, but also, and equally, and more importantly, a lot of people who believed in me even when I didn't believe in myself. And that encouragement puts me in a position to take up space and to know that I am not in the legislature, so I can be the last voice who carries my distinction in that space. But I need to carry myself with a level of integrity, intellect, to work really hard with my colleagues to make it clear to other young people, to other people of color, to other people who know what it's like to be economically struggle, for people who know what it's like to not have government work in a consistent way, to that small business owner who's spending more time filling out paperwork than they are actually being in their business, whatever your distinction is, I think it's part of my responsibility to know that I belong. And by knowing that you belong and belonging and living in your skin, it, it, it encourages other people to be authentic without you giving a class. Let's take one more and I have to leave. This side of the room, I'm looking at you. This was the part where I was like, don't wait on your neighbor, your neighbor's waiting on you. And so it's like probably one or two of you are thinking, maybe I have, I have something I want to say. I won't even look at you. <laughs> I, I see you. I see you. No, hold on. I see you. But I believe in this side of the room. There we go. I told you. I believe. You had to have faith. And, and what I would like to do, if it's okay, I would love to hear your question, and then if we could take your question, I will answer both of your questions, and then I will like run out of here like crazy. And thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm in the chair. Awesome. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm Emmett Shea. I'm a sophomore political science major at Villanova. Yeah. Um, so I took a class last semester mm -hmm. um, called Public Policy Paths, and we had a bunch of people, some who worked in your house and others come to speak to us about working in public policy. And some are more hesitant than others on having a bunch of kids in college essentially running for public office. Um, do you have any advice in terms of being a you know, college student, how to get involved mm -hmm. in public policy in a place where you kind of feel kind of new? I'm not from Pennsylvania, so in terms of getting involved in public policy at, a, at like a younger age, do you have any tips or ideas on how to do that? All right, perfect, great. Hold that. And where, where are you from? I'm from New York. Okay, pretty good. All right, I'll take it, please. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you for coming out tonight. Yeah. Um, my name is Dan. I'm a student in law school. I think some of my other classmates are here tonight. Yeah. And um, I heard a lot about how it takes a long time for things to get passed, mostly having to do with the separation of powers. But then I hear also a lot about when you're speaking, you know, the individual, the power of the individual, the one, but ultimately, you know, we the people make the laws. I wanted to, or we the people, you know, put the people in power to make them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know how you reconcile with your political philosophy, you know, the patience to respect that process, but then also, you know, your maybe frustrations for how long things do take to get done. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't know if I, let me say it this way. You have to understand things, even things you don't respect. I think the process takes too long. I think, however, sometimes I'm grateful for it. And so I live in this nuance about what it takes to get big things done. Because sometimes what can happen is that a political window of opportunity is open up because something's in the news, everybody cares about it, and so people wanna rush to do something about it or be seen 
as doing something about it on a variety of different things. And so what can happen in that silo is that actually sometimes we create really bad policy as a result of us moving quickly to respond to something emotional or whatever the case may be. You know, as a matter of, of, of practice, I'm always worried when we have a bill that's named after someone. Because a colleague of mine, Greg Vitale, Representative Vitale, has a great, great quote where he says, good stories make bad laws. Because when we do things that are, even when the story, I mean, there are people who's, you can just think about the stories of why somebody would have a bill named after them for a variety of different things. They had a health challenge, somebody passed, somebody had a really bad interaction with the government in some way, and so we gotta fix it. But our deliberative process is integral to the safety and security of your rights, and for us to do the necessary work of vetting things that become law. Because that process takes so long, it is very difficult to overturn a law. Very difficult to do. Which is why you'll see governors or presidents rush to do an executive order on something because many of them have engaged with the legislature either as a member or, or in some other position. And they probably walk into that executive position with a level of frustration and angst about getting things done or being seen as getting things done. And so you do an executive order, make people you know, feel like you did something. And sometimes you actually can do great things through executive order, direct agencies to adjust the way that they engage in ways that can be deeply meaningful. And so I don't mean to minimize it. But what I do mean to say is that the challenges, as big as they are, they require us to be thoughtful enough and patient enough to get it right, not to just get something that we can celebrate. So that's, that's the first thing I would say. And this will connect sort of to the point of uh, running for office and young people being engaged and what do you mean about personal civic action? How do I navigate that tension? I would suggest that what we need in this moment, more than any big bill, more than any particular policy prescription, is we need to care about each other more than I think a lot of folks' actions would show that we do. You know, like many of you, you know, as a millennial, I grew up in this very much on the cusp of huge uh, technological advances while also having to like, I had to wait for the internet. None of you understand that pain. You don't get it. Well, you want this first row. They're like, we're good. Well, you had to download the internet from a disk, and then you waited for the internet. And if you wanted to be on the internet, think about this. You had to decide whether you wanted to be on the phone or be on the internet. It was like this Faustian bargain that you had to make. And if you grew up in my house and you wanted to get on the internet, you had to get on the internet at such a time where your mom wasn't calling to check in on you and heard the buzzer, and then she'd say, were you on the internet? And you say, no, and she's like, I caught it, and the phone was buzzing, and so, I, okay, sorry, I'm going down a tangent, but, but the reason I highlight this is because growing up on the advent of this, I was very hopeful about what these technological advances could mean for my ability to engage outside of my neighborhood, to engage with friends that I couldn't see anymore, and whatever the case may be. And so because of social media, we are engaging with a version of each other a lot. But I think many folks would rightfully say we are engaging with each other a lot less. And what happens is, because of the algorithm, because technology is getting so good at understanding us, I don't just mean this in political way, but we live in zones where we kind of only engage with people who already like the things we like, who are already from similar places that we're from. And so the ability to naturally, and not already in a heated political environment, but to naturally engage with somebody who may disagree with you and who may disagree in a way that actually changes your mind, those possibilities are far and fewer in between. And so when I think about the number one thing I urge people to do, 
is to literally knock on your neighbor's door, not for anything, but literally to like know your neighbor. That doesn't require a political bill, doesn't require anything. And a lot of people do not know the people who live on their block, do not know them. Other than to say, it's like trash day, your trash is still out. That small thing will open up not only your world, but open up the possibilities for what you can collectively build in your neighborhood in a way bigger than any campaign. And I mention that because engagement around campaigns is so limited. When I knock on a door and it's only to say vote for this person, after you do that, our work is done. We have no reason to engage anymore because I've convinced you to do the thing I want and now I'm on to the next door to convince that person to do the thing I want. I'm not coming to you to genuinely m engage with you in the way that makes life so full and so beautiful. And so that's what I would say. For young people, I think we are better at doing that than we would expect because we're armed with more of the tools that could make that engagement easier and that engagement more regular, but I don't know that we utilize the great tools in the ways that we could to achieve those outcomes. And so what I would suggest is when you consider yourself politically involved, engaged, everybody does not have to run for office. I am not discouraging you against running for office. But I had somebody uh, say to me, this woman mayor, former mayor of Houston, and she told this story that I love, and she said this young woman came up to her and said, I want to run for office, and she said, why? She said, well, because you were in office, and I would love to run for office, because that sounds great. And she said, you should not run for office. And as a politician, you're never supposed to say that people shouldn't run for office. But politics, political office, is a tool. And so the question to me, when you look at a bunch of things scattered on the floor and you tell me you want to build something, I'm less interested in what tool you want, and I'm more interested in what do you want to build. And so everybody's not going to get the hammer of being in legislative office or the wrench or whatever in this metaphor, whatever you want the political office to be. But everybody has access to something, even if it's just grabbing a piece of wood and handing it to the person. And so what you can do as a young person is share your story, share your life to elected officials who I promise you are listening to you. And sometimes you hear something that really does change your mind or clue you into a policy area of interest that you did not have before. That's something you can do without doing anything. If you are interested in a campaign, if you do find a person who inspires you, get involved in that campaign, but recognize even if you really care about that person, you're great and you work really hard and they win, no dubs. There will be no dubs. The final thing that I would say is, if you do want to run for office, I would encourage you to run. And when you ask how, I would lead you back to the three letters I started with, run. Because when you run, you will meet people who you did not know before, who you will meet by virtue of running, who might end up supporting you. You will also be able to engage it with your community, even if you lose, in a way that you would not before. You know, as an elected official or a candidate for office, you get invited to things you would never naturally be invited to. Otherwise, that allows you to understand your neighborhood ways better than you probably would. And so I would encourage you to think about running, but I would also encourage you to engage in building community. And it can start right here at Villanova, um, you know, more than, more than you would otherwise. And so I'm going to stop here. My chief of staff is like, I have to leave. Um, and I appreciate you all so much. God bless you. And Father, thank you. <laughs>